Minus 15. Respect all, fear none. Into the upper deck. Intensity is not a perfect. Oh, mercy! Five, four, three, two, one. There will be a Game 7 in the 115th edition of the World Series, thanks in large part to Steven Strasburg, Juan Soto, and Anthony Rendon as the Nationals win Game 6 here at Minute Maid Park 7-2 behind some stellar outings uh, from the Nationals on all sides of the ball. Welcome into the Mass and Alexis podcast, everybody. Bobby Blanco, Paul Mancano with you as always. Of course, we are brought to you by Marymount University. Visit MarymountSaints.com to learn more about our student athletes and programs today. Paul, this game had it all. A phenomenal starting pitching performance. Nationals played small ball. They hit home runs. They played some great defense behind their pitchers, uh, two of which they only used uh, tonight, uh, and obviously some drama and controversy. All in the game, not in the Game 7, but all in the game to send the World Series to a Game 7. Ridiculous game. It was a, a game for the ages. Um, in some ways it, not in a way that baseball would like or that I think fans in general would r like just because of the controversy mm -hmm. you never like to see that and you never like to see it affect a game like that um, but it added to the drama yeah and I had a conversation with Mark Zuckerman right afterwards and I thought he put it best he said after all of that craziness that was going on in this game with the umpires with the homers um through it all, in the eye of the storm, was Steven Strasburg. Yeah. He was outstanding, unfazed by everything around him. Uh, Adam Eaton said after the game, or uh, yeah, Adam Eaton said after the game, he just gets a look in his eye. You can just tell. Ryan Zimmerman said after the game that uh, Strasburg, that's the biggest change that he's seen over the course of his career. He's seen Strasburg's whole career, but he's unfazed in ways that he has not been in, in previous years. He's a veteran. He's done this before, and he delivered – the start of his life tonight. Yeah, yeah. quite the wordsmith, Mark, Mark Zuckerman. He should get his own blog or something. Um, yeah, Steven Strasburg, we talked about it countless times throughout his career. You know, if it wasn't 70 and su sunny degrees out, he would struggle because he needed almost perfect conditions to pitch in. And that has changed drastically <laughs> over the past couple of seasons. And none more. We've seen 5-0 and this postseason. That, I saw people mentioning that, you know, we'll talk obviously about the top of the seventh and the Trey Turner interference call. But that whole process, that delayed, but I saw people mentioning, you know, this is more time for him to cool off yeah. in the dugout because no DH, he's not, I mean, with the DH, he's not hitting. It's, this is time for him to maybe, you know, lose focus or yeah. something because it's just, uh, you know, that, that review took, or whatever it was, took way too long. Obviously, we'll talk about that too. But, and yeah, maybe old Steven Strasburg from five, maybe even three years ago would have been phased by that, but not this new Steven Strasburg, not this Strasburg that is carrying the Nationals through the post-series, postseason, excuse me, and on the cusp of winning a World Series type t championship. And how many times have we seen Nationals pitchers give up runs in the first inning and then Seems settle like down? Yeah. And then, I, I mean, he went obviously over 100, but he almost threw a complete game. Yeah. That is unheard of in a World Series game for the most part, unless you're throwing a shutout. Yep. Um, the fact that he was able to not only settle down and get guys out, but then to keep his pitch count so low yeah. uh, and do such weak contact and strike out so many guys to the point where he could get to that ninth inning. Dave did not even have to turn to the bullpen until that ninth inning. That was an unbelievable start. I mean, two years ago in the uh, his flu game, if you will, that, yeah. uh, in Chicago, in Chicago. That was undoubtedly, at that point in his career, the start of his life, yep. uh, of, of, his, of his career. 100%. And that, also an elimination game yeah, on the road. And that began, I think, the change in perspective and uh, the change in, in the media's perspective, the outside perception of, Mac, of uh, Steven Strasburg. Yeah. Um, and all of a sudden he switched from the guy who was shut down in his rookie year the guy who couldn't quite battle, uh, you know, through injuries, who always got injured, who, uh, you know, who couldn't quite get there, into this is the guy that we all thought he would be. Yeah. And this is the guy, this is exactly, I mean, you, you look at this, the journey that he has been on since he was drafted first overall, 
and it was to deliver a start like that tonight. Yeah, and Steven Strasburg is running a name for himself in baseball history in yeah. October. He's become one of the best pitchers. We can maybe spend some time this offseason talking about all the numbers that he's throwing up yeah. in his career as a, as a postseason starting pitcher, one of the best all time now. That ERA is so unbelievably low uh, in his postseason starts. It's just incredible. Um, yeah, you mentioned the pitch count. To put it in perspective, you know, Justin Verlander only went five innings and gave up, obviously, three runs. He threw 93 pitches. Steven Strasburg got one out in the ninth, and he only threw 104. So just, like, uh, only 11 more pitches and basically pitched double the amount of innings. So, yeah. uh, I mean, truly, truly remarkable. Like you said, I, that was very key for him to establish – the use of his changeup, the use of his curveball, to keep this Astros lineup off balance so that he could get deeper into games and get quick outs. He didn't need to rely too much on double play balls like we saw Joe Ross kind of have to rely on uh, back in game five. Mm -hmm. But that kept Steven in the game as long as possible. And you know what? I'm looking at this my box score right now, Paul. I see for the pitchers used by the Nationals, Steven Strasburg and Sean Doolittle only for 11 pitches. And on the Astros, Verlander, Peacock, Harris, Presley, Davinsky, guys that, I mean, obviously a Game 7 in the World Series is all hands on deck. You're going to need everybody. But, you know, guys starting to get maybe a little taxed. You know, there were some – this game, to keep in mind, was still a close game in the seventh inning. Yeah. And the Astros let it get away from them because – and some of these relievers are coming in and giving up runs. And I think – Davey Martinez probably wouldn't. I was almost just the slightest bit surprised that he brought in Doolittle. But then in, you got to remember it's still an elimination game. Right. You know, you still can't have any outs to play with. But the fact that he only had to get two outs in that ninth inning is absolutely massive, considering how much that bullpen was used in game five um, at Nationals Park. Um, but, yeah, I mean, he, he, he settled in, and, and this is that was the loudest that first inning that I've heard Minute Maid Park in Me the, th what, three games that we've yeah, seen so, here. Yeah. Uh, it f Because it felt like they were, you know, inching closer towards this thing. And it yeah. felt like if they could just deal a deathly blow to the Nats uh, early on and, and get up, they, that they wouldn't, the Nats wouldn't be able to recover. And, the, the, I mean, not only the fact that Strasburg went deep in this game, the fact that he only allowed two runs in that first inning when it felt like it could – it, we, you know, after that first inning, it felt like a five-run inning. Yeah, yeah. Um, the way that uh, the, the crowd, the Bregman homer, the fact that Bregman carried his bat past first base, it felt like what could have been the, the death blow and the exclamation point, even though it was only a two-run inning. But he kept it to two runs, and he kept the Nats in the game. And, I mean, well, you know, we, we will eventually talk about that offense because the fact that they finally woke up. We had three games of one-run uh, one runs a piece yeah. for the Nationals offense. They finally, finally woke up, and it was the guys that we expected all along. Yeah, yeah. just quickly to finish up on Strauss, yeah. the fourth, fifth, and sixth innings were innings that the, the Astros had base runners reach every single time and a couple of times in scoring position, and Strasburg was able to shut it down and get out of those innings clean. Without That's when you kind of felt the Astros maybe building some momentum. Yeah. And I believe at that point it was still – well, the, the Nationals took the lead in the fifth. So, yeah, it was a, a one-run game, and you kind of just felt, okay, it's going to come, it's going to come, and it never did. Yeah. Strauss was able to shut it down, like you said, and get out of it, and that was huge. Uh, there's so many different parts to it. I, I, I think, you know, obviously this was probably his last – this is definitely his, his last outing of the season. You know, he's not going to pitch again until spring training, so there was no limit to – you know, let him go empty as deep. Empty the tank. Yeah, empty the tank, let him go as deep as he can. But – you know, just being able to conserve outs. And we talked about how you can't give this lineup cheap outs or, or give them extra outs. Um, and and he didn't. And he was yeah. able to get out of tough situations. All right, let's talk about the offense real quick, too, before we get into the bigger story. Obviously, that kind of consumed this game in the top of the seventh. But quickly, Soto homers again. Eaton with another homer. Rendon finally gets a long ball in his hometown. The big bats came to play. In game six, when they needed it the most. I mean, when was the last Rendon homer that we saw? I don't know if I can name it. Game five against the Dodgers, probably. Yeah, yeah. I think that was it. <laughs> that massive blast that yeah. he had. Um, Soto already, what, his third of the this World Series, mm -hmm. which was absolutely demolished. Just another one. This one to right field, absolutely crushed. But for Rendon to wake up like that, I mean, after game five, we were talking about, look, the guy got you here. But that being said, 
he was struggling in this World Series. He was hitting 200 coming into the game tonight. Barreled up some balls and crushed that home run. Yeah. And that is the power of that 3-4 punch. I mean, you know, Eaton hitting that game-tying homer was obviously huge. Um, and frankly, I didn't I didn't know how much Eaton had quite left, especially power wise um, at this point. He yeah. had never played in a, in a world in a postseason before. Um, but the fact that that three, four punch was able to wake up in the way that they did shows that they can carry any th- this team through any games. Yeah. If they are hitting and they were crushing the ball today that Rendon and Soto King can absolutely carry this offense. Yeah, yeah. How about this day for Anthony Rendon? 3 for 4 with a walk and five RBIs. Not a bad day at the plate at all. Yep. Um, and, all right, so let's talk about Trey Turner. We also talked about how he needed to get going at the top of the lineup. He get, he reached base a handful of times. He should have been on base one more, one more time because of this interference call. But finally, him, you know, I think him getting a base hit right at the top of the inning, right at the start of the game, that set the tone. Obviously, he ends up scoring, gives the yeah. Nationals an early one nothing lead, but – I think that really set the tone for the game. We talked about it all the time, especially last podcast, about how he is the table setter. He is the one, you know, yep. you can't always rely on Rendon Soto. It would be great if they could hit like they did tonight every single night, but it makes it that much easier and, and, and more fruitful when Trey Turner's on base. Yeah. And he got on base tonight. Um, so now let's go to the seventh inning. Of course, that was the big controversy and the drama that consumed the night. I'll say this on the top. Luckily, it had ended up not affecting the outcome of the game. The Nationals won, which they should have. Could you imagine if the Ashes would have come back and won this game? Just the uproar around baseball. Baseball would have such a, an interesting uh, situation on their hands, to say the least. A lot of uh, questions to answer. Yeah. And you were there for the uh, post-game press conference. Yeah, Joe Torre Joe, spoke. Joe Torre. Yeah, and, you know, we talked – they showed on the broadcast that he, Joe Torre was meeting with the umpires during the game on the field. Um, just a weird – so – my Joe Torre, first of all, says that it was the right call. I, I just don't see, one, how it's the right call. Break it down real quick. Trey Turner hits a soft dribbler, I believe. No, it was right in front of him. It was the catcher. It was a 2-3 two, put, two, put out. Running down first baseline. Okay, yes, he took a couple steps inside the fair line, but I believe his last step was – outside that fair fair line and then before he hit the bag he gets in the way it's a bad throw it's behind Guriel at first base he Trey Turner's in the way Guriel can't make the catch um Jan Gomes goes to third Trey goes to second it should be run two runs in the corner position no outs Anthony Unknown coming to the plate he's called out Trey Turner for catcher's interference Jan Gomes has to go back to first base sorry you're right runner's interference I think it's he, technically batter's. Is it really? He, yeah. Because he's the batter? Yeah. Okay. So batter's Until interference. He reaches, he's the batter. Um, and, again, to me, it's just – it's not so much that it's <laughs> the wrong call. It's the, the, also the process that we got – how we got to it still being the wrong call. You know what I mean? Like where we – JB asked for a review. It's not reviewable because it's a judgment call. How is a judgment call not reviewable? You're, you're, you're basing a call on a world, especially in the World Series, but in any sport, you're basing a call off someone's personal judgment. How We have tape. We have technology. How do we know? All right, this is what he called on the field. Let's go back and just make sure it's the right call. How those aren't reviewable, I'll, I'll never understand. And then they go back. So I guess the Nationals protest the call. I think yeah. you're allowed to do that, which is another thing, which is weird. So they go do that, and then they confirm there's a whole bunch of communication injuries. It was just a kind of a show at the top of the seventh, that whole thing. The call ends up standing. Again, it didn't end up affecting the Nationals or hurting them because Rendon has a two-run bomb. But could you imagine if they would have lost by one and there would have been one extra runner on base for that three-run bomb instead? It was just a whole scenario where MLB seemed to really kind of mess this one up. Trey Turner said after the game, the first thing going through his head when that call was confirmed was, here we go again. He had flashbacks to NLDS Game 5 from 2017 when Matt Wieters had a catcher's interference, mm-hmm. and the ball went down that the first baseline on a bad throw. Yeah. Um, and it that play, I believe, should have been, rule, should have been blown dead. Mm-hmm. The runner, I think, should have just been awarded first base. I think if I – we were looking it up yeah. post-game – before the catcher's interference, he threw a ball down the line. It was a it was a strikeout swinging mm. pass ball 
and Matt Wieters threw the ball to first, and it got away from his Zimmerman. Right. Threw about so the runner was safe. He was he struck out, but he was safe. Yeah, which I'm sure is the right thing to do. And then the next batter, I believe, hit a double to score some runs, and then the following right. batter after that was the catcher's interference that allowed them to get to another batter, who then also hit like a couple of RBIs. Right. Just so it's just another flashback. Yes. To yeah. like, how is this happening? This again? this game did not reach that level of of Madness? shenanigans yeah. chaos but um that play certainly did have some kind of flashbacks for that especially because that game ended what nine to eight yeah that was a one or two run game that ended up being that and it was an elimination game for the nationals and it was a controversial call that sh- never should have been made and you know the Anytime something like that happens, you never want it to affect the game because it, it's it's an elimination game. Everything is on the line for this team. Yeah. Um, I haven't gone back and watched the Zapruder film and and you know seen every step that Trey takes down the line. Um, I'm sure there are people that have already broken that down to make sure. But the the point is, um, like you said, Bobby, it's the fact that it was that it got to that the 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 process that it took to get to that decision and the fact that it was still upheld after what felt like a 20 minute review that long. entirely ruined the flow of the game as you said at the top top of the podcast that could have thrown Steven Strasburg out of his groove yep. who knows it might have i mean uh, uh Verlander was was still on the mound at that point or no it was no, no, longer, no, no, Verlander. It was no longer Verlander no longer in 7th that would have been i think Will Harris okay that might have thrown him out of the, his groove to the point where he gives up that two run homer to Anthony Rendon mm. it affected the game and and it's a shame because that was an outstanding game with so many great plays great moments and yet the storyline after it maybe what the biggest storyline yeah. is this play Ryan Zimmerman said after the game, the first question he was asked was about the play, and he said, I don't want to talk about it. I try not to comment comment on uh, umpires' decisions, and, you know, they have a hard job, that type of thing, which he took the high road. Um, so did David Martinez, by the way. And But he yeah, – oh, okay, good good to hear, which is crazy because of how angry he, we saw I him. I've never seen him so angry. No. Um, this and man also had a heart surgery, like, a month ago. Yeah, somebody texted me, good, good – Good Lord, yeah. Davey, your heart. Yeah. <laughs> um, you could literally see the veins popping out of his neck. Uh, frightening. Yeah. Frightening. Chappell had to hold him back on the field. Yeah. I've never seen anyone that had to do that And to this Davey. was not a fake hold back. This no. was a, we're holding you back so you don't there get was, like, suspended. There was veins popping out Chip Hill's forearms because yeah. he had to use his whole strength to keep back Davey Martinez. Yeah. Um, and, and good for Davey. I mean, he was right to do that. He's gotten upset at the umpires, rightfully so, earlier on in the series. It felt like that was a boiling point for him, and he had re- he had gotten over the line. But um, back to Zimmerman, I mean, he, he made the best point, which is I just want to focus on, you know, the story after this game should be Anthony Rendon and Steven Strasburg and Juan Soto, great players making great plays, not umpires making bad judgment calls. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I th- we talk about umpires, and, you know, the best way for them to impact the game is to not be the story of the game. You know, yep. it's like it's – you know, if we're not talking about them, that means you did your job well. Exactly. And, but we're here. I think Jan Gomes kind of mentioned that too. After I want to say it was Game Five, I think a reporter asked yep. him, you know, what do you think about some of those missed calls? And he said, I'm not going to talk about that. But the fact that you're asking answers your own question. Perfect, perfect way to put that. Right. So uh, kudos to the national. I mean, this has been unfortunately, I want to say outside of Game One, every it feels like every game has had some kind of little controversy. I mean, luckily, nothing too drastic where it's changing the course of the outcome of the games. But I feel like we're talking about the umpires a little too much that I would care for, that I'm sure fans would care for, than the players and the coaches want to talk about them in a World Series. You know, it's like, let's let it play out on the field. Don't be be the storyline. It should never be like this. And unfortunately, tonight definitely was. Again, the the process. How... A judgment call. If you're if you're gonna give so much ju- judgment power to these umpires, you, you gotta want at least hold them accountable. How, well, umpires never have to speak after games. How come they never have to do that? And two, let's we again we have this process and these technologies in place to kind of back them up and be like, all right, let's go to the tape and make sure your judgment. Was, I mean, you know, you're giving them all power out there, and it felt like they just kind of, I don't want to say they abused it but like it's just i don't understand how you go back and make that call and what and the whole protest in the game thing is complicated and weird too the process is just wrong there has to be a better way to go about this and 
they, there's te- there's communication issues now between them and their head co- MLB headquarters in New York. It's like it's the World Series. Let's let's tighten the ship a little bit. And Joe Torre did apologize in his press conference, being like the communication thing. That's something we can fix and handle. That should never be the case. But I mean, I, I did not expect him to come out and say that the umpires made it wrong. He's going to back the umpires. Yeah. Um, and, and it's and just unfortunate how it all went down. And they're never going to overturn a game under protest, as no. we know, all know that that's... Uh, <laughs> Apparently, it's only happened a handful of times in yeah. the, the history of baseball. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is a ridiculous thing that that, that isn't the option for yeah. managers to go or teams to go after that point. But there was another judgment call earlier on in the game, again, a play that ended up not mattering at all, but... Uh, Victor Robles, if you might remember, uh, was called out on a check swing that his uh, it appeared on replay that the barrel, the bat never crossed the plate. The home plate umpire, I thought for sure. Well, I mean, watching it live, it did not look like it, it crossed the plate, but that happens all the time. I mean, the, you know, and then you watch the replay. But he didn't he never called on the first base umpire to double check that call. Yeah. And that's another play. That's a judgment call that you, you I don't I don't believe you can review that. Um, I mean, that that is another decision that if we're going to to have this technology, why not use it to actually get these calls right? Yeah. Especially when you're in in, an elimination game in game six of the World Series. It's an it was an embarrassing situation um, for all of baseball. And look, it 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 was a game that started back at eight o'clock on the east coast Mm -hmm. we've seen four hour games feels like every night of this world series yep that review added 15 minutes when you say to the to the length of the game it felt like it at least um I and think, like, the, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No. But, like, the, you know, because when they, for those who don't know, like, when there's a review, on, like, they time it, and then, like, the official yeah. score will announce the estimated time of the review was four minutes, right. blah, blah, blah. I couldn't really hear out here, but I believe it was around six minutes, which that, is still which is way too long. And yeah. it felt like, I think the whole entire process yeah. with Davey arguing, them explaining yes. to Agent Hint, that probably was, like, more 15, 20 minutes. Right. Um, that just adds, that's just, I mean, on a, on a scale that doesn't affect the Nationals and the Astros, that's so embarrassing yeah. for the for the league because how many people tuned out of that game to s- switch it over to the NBA or, or or the news or go to bed yeah. at that point um, because that was like the 10, 10 o'clock on the East Coast yeah. or something ridiculous like that as I kicked the camera. Um, so that, that was just a, an embarrassing story, and it's a shame that we have to talk about it in this podcast. Yeah. I would always say, though, you know, it's kind of frustrating. I would always say, Take your time as long as you get the call right. True. It's even true. more fresh than when you take your time and then get and still get it wrong. wrong. Yeah. And and Joe Torre like literally read in his press conference line by line the rule, mm. uh, which I still don't agree that Trey Turner violated that rule. Right. Uh, just a very frustrating scenario. I, I'm just really glad that we're not talking about how this affected the outcome of the game. Back to your point about the Victor Robles check swin. I will never understand umpires who you have first base and third base side umpire for not that specific reason but yeah. to help you with those calls i think it's a you know if you're the umpire okay i think he swung but let me just double check yeah because i'm also standing behind him yep and can't see depth perception if the, bo- if the barrel actually crossed the plate that guy can see let me ask let me just double check just yep. to make sure let's get the call right it just kind of felt like i hate using this term but like an ump show like to just like yeah. nope i'm right um it's th- this is my game yeah and you're out and you know Basketball, we have technology to see if the ball goes into the rim before the buzzard. We soccer, if the goal line technology, same thing with hockey, football, if the nose go crosses the end zone, how do we not have that in place for check swings yeah. in baseball? I mean, it's just it's you need it. Yeah. You need it. That's a huge call right there. Also, think about how I mean, this is not a reason to do it specifically, but think about how Victor Robles has been struggling in this series at the plate at times. You know, if he stays at bat there, he might be able to get something going, draw a walk or get a base hit or something. And that probably just that check swing. And then also not being checked. Also the other call in game five, just probably adding yep. more frustration to him. You hope that he can kind of shake it off and maybe break out in game seven. Yeah. It, not to get too tangential here, but the, it is mind boggling to, to, when you think about the angle that the home plate umpire has to see, I, I don't understand how you could ever determine that whether the bat really crossed home plate Given the angle, I mean, a, I almost want to reenact it here because I can't, yeah. not to mention that, that you're looking over the, the catcher's shoulder. Yep. So the catcher probably has blocked the bottom of the zone yes. or and the, the plate. And the plate, yeah. yeah. Um, 
and and it's it's like you, you, ridiculous. I mean, the, the not just depth; it's just understanding angles of. Like, well, let's get Hannah Broder yeah, and get say, the physics to, of this, but ridiculous. There is a line right here on the floor as we're recording this podcast at Minute Maid Park. If you were to stand in front of me and like swing your mic, your microphone. I would never be able to tell if across the line or when yeah, it, yeah. at what point it crosses the line or not. Like, it's, how can a umpire yeah. also a fo- like a a split second check yeah. It's just and you're also looking for, um, what you know where it is in the strike zone. Yeah. So that's that is definitely your secondary concern. Oh, that's true. You're, you're not even looking at the bat. Yeah. You're looking at the ball probably instead. Yeah, exactly. So, so <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, but the story of this anyway, game here's ultimately. <laughs> uh, I mean, the fact that the Nats were able to stay alive. The, the, they have been, I think Brittany Giroli of The Athletic tweeted after this game, I hope people understand how truly special this run has been for the Nationals. I think a lot of people do. But it has, when when this is all over, regardless of the outcome tomorrow, in, in a few weeks or months or however long it takes, we will sit down and look at the ridiculous things that got them to this place, yeah. how close they were to elimination and going home in the wild card game. It, it, what feels like dozens of uh, yeah. dozens of times in a one month span, and the type of performances. Steven Strasburg is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the performances that we've seen from these players um, over the past couple of weeks. And I said it when the it felt like the Nats were going to get eliminated tonight. I said it two days ago after Game Five that it's hard to criticize any player because they got them there. Uh, you know, they may struggle at one point along the way, but. The truth is every one of these guys had to contribute in some way for them to get to this point. It's really unbelievable. And if you you think about it, at some point in mid-September, they were out of the wild card spot. And now here they are forcing a game seven on the World Series. Mark Zuckerman asked Adam Eaton pregame, you know, how do you – he's like, I know you can't answer this now, but, like, how do you kind of evaluate or put into words what this team has accomplished this season – and I was like, I can't answer that question right now. Yeah. Ask me after this. And it's like, but we can do it. But it's like, <laughs> it's it's really unbelievable. And, you know, I think after losing three straight at home, had the Nationals dropped tonight, it would have mm. been really hard to stomach, I think, for, for me, both as a Incredible. reporter and as a fan. The, man, you couldn't win one game at home and then you you, lo- you, you yeah. lost four in a row. Granted, the Astros are a great team, but that's just – yeah. after winning the first two to drop four in a row, that's just really crushing. I think forcing a game seven – you know, whatever happens tomorrow, if you lose, like we said, I've said a hundred times on this podcast, there's no shame losing to the Astros. There's certainly no shame in losing to the Astros at home in a game seven. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, not to have a defeatist attitude, no, like no, no, no. but, but yeah, I completely agree. I mean, and the fact that they battled back, especially today, just shows you everything that we've already seen a million times from this team. Yeah. They were four outs away from, being eliminated in the wild card game. They were six outs away from being eliminated in the NLDS game, game five. Game five, and they were also facing you know, elimination like, in game four. Yeah, yes, that's true. So they were 27 outs, and then they were um, six outs, and they were 27 outs, and, and they didn't tie until the top of the fifth. So what's five times? Three, 15 outs. 15 outs from being eliminated well, in four, game six. So 12 outs, but yeah. So, or was, yeah, so... Either Just way, on the brink of elimination, countless times. Countless times. And I fought, fought back. The the margin for error has been razor thin, and they just have not cared. All right, let's shift our focus to tomorrow night, Game 7 here before we get out of here. It's going to be Max Scherzer, who unbelievably was throwing. The fact that the, the that's, like, field. not even the top story from tonight. Right. That's a good point. How he was physically throwing on flat ground today. Uh, at Paul Mancano and at Massa Nationals for that video uh, from him in the outfield. Playing catch, he was even getting warm in the bullpen. He said post game, you called him that he, that he would have. He said there he was s- getting ready yeah, for a situation. He said there are scenarios that I would have pitched. I will. I wanted to, nobody asked the follow up, but I would have wanted to know exactly what scenarios that would have been. Thank God he did not have to throw yes, in this game. Yes, and now he's able to start. He says he's full go. Davies says he's full go. I am just beyond shocked and bel- yeah. that that is even a possibility. We were talking yeah. about the other night, and we were going back to his previous injury, and he said this was worse, and he didn't pitch for 10 days. He could not move his neck, his right arm, as of 48 hours ago. Yeah. Less than 48 hours before he was throwing in that bullpen. 
that is mind boggling. I mean, shout out to Paul Lassard and, and the entire training staff and the team doctors for, I guess, for quarter zone shots and yeah. just pumping up with painkillers to see how he can move. So he'll face Zach Granke in game seven. Paul, we talked about, right? It's two, also, I think the first time uh, two former Cy Young award winners will face off against each other in a game seven in the wow. World Series. Um, Paul, we talked about how after game five, going into game six, how the lineups will adjust to Verlander and Strasburg yeah. and how those pitchers will also adjust to the lineups. Obviously, the Nationals got the best of Verlander. Strasburg was able to quiet the, the, the Astros lineup for the most part. The Nationals lineup saw Granke just a couple of days ago. He, pitched, he started game three. Max hasn't started, hasn't pitched since game one. Yeah. You hope that – and, and Granke was great in game three, and he, he deserved that win. You, I guess the recipe is going to be the same tomorrow night as tonight. You know, can you make adjustments against him? Get to him early too, because that's been a, that's been one of um, he, his downfalls this postseason. Yeah. And can Max give you enough quality innings? And that's the key, quality innings. It's great that he can throw, but how? Qu- yeah. what, what kind of what level will he be at? Uh, can he give you quality innings and make his own adjustments and and quiet down this Astros lineup because they hit him a couple of times in Game One. Well, you hope it's the reverse of the Garrett Cole. What happened with him? The fact that he got hit around in Game One of the World Series and yep. then he made adjustments and the Nationals were not ready for him in Game Five, and he shut uh, Game Five. Yep. Correct. Yeah, and he shut Sunday. them down. Um, you hope it's the reverse of that. The fact that the, now the offense will have time yep. to have made adjustments um, and get ready for Granky tomorrow. Um, I believe it was uh, Cabrera that historically has hit uh, Granky very yep, well. Yep. So he's already in the lineup. We know that because DH is open for Howie Kendrick. Yep. But um, he ha- he hit Granky pretty well. Uh, I think he had two hits at least in yeah, that. Yeah. I think in, went two for four in in uh, game five. I am no, so no three. Lost. Game three Friday night. Game three. Good gosh. Um, it's been a long postseason, folks. I don't know where I am and. Uh, so he, you know, he's going to be a, a a big component. But the game three was the start of the struggles for yeah. the Nationals' offense. That was the night where they started to look really faulty at the plate. Yep. So the the they have to be able to um, get some rallies going against Granky. And I have, if I were to tell you I had any idea what we're going to see from Max tomorrow, I would be lying. I have no idea what we're going to see from him tomorrow. He's, he said, uh, "You know, it's game. Fo- it's game seven. Let's go." That's all he said. Jesus. Yeah. Again, it's 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 great that he can pitch, and you know, it's also great if he can go deep. But again, I'm more looking at the quality of yeah. innings. I think you could, uh, if you could get five quality innings from him, you're, you're going to have Patrick Corbin available. You're going to have Anibal Sanchez available. Joe Ross will probably be available again. He was good. At, I mean, you'll have. Bridges options available to get from Max yep. to Huddy and Doolittle later in the innings. So I, I, I'm not going to say he'll be on a really tight leash, but he's got to be on some sort of leash because, again, game seven, a couple of runs, you might have to start thinking about yanking him because and we'll see how he looks. But if yeah. he's not giving out quality pitches, quality innings, you can't keep him in for too long just for the sake because he's Max Scherzer. But Mark Zuckerman did say before the game that Davey said before the game that uh, he doesn't want to be the one to pull Max Scherzer prematurely from a game seven, yeah. Yeah. which I don't I don't blame him. Uh, I mean, we've seen Max get mad at Davey for pulling him in, in regular season games. And a Can you random imagine? game in Cincinnati, yeah. It will be like – how Davey reacted to the ump if he tries to pull him early. <laughs> um, not quite that level, yeah. but it is – he is going to do everything. I mean, this is going to be like a bloody sock game from Max yeah. Scherzer. I mean, it could be. We could be talking about this Steven Strasburg start and oh tomorrow's God, Max yeah. Scherzer start for the rest of baseball history. And for all time. Mark, of course, another baseball historian, threw out there the 2001 Arizona Diamondbacks that – Mike Rizzo was a part of in the front office of that team that there are so many call, uh, connections to that team because of the way that the rotation was built with mm-hmm. that team and this team. That team took seven games to win the World Series. Randy Johnson started game six and then came out of the bullpen, I believe, for one inning of game seven yeah. after Kurt Schilling started that game. I really don't think Steven Strasburg would ever do that. But the fact that he threw that out there, I mean, it, it, you know, I don't think it would reach that level. But it's game seven, and it is 
all hands on deck. You save two outs because you pull them in the in the eighth. I mean, like you said, we've seen it before. I am at game seven. <laughs> it's been a long postseason. I am done trying to guess what this team is doing. I have no no idea. No idea we what's said, going on we tomorrow. You said Max no Scherzer clue. was never going to pitch again this this yeah. year. Now he's pitching game seven. I mean, we just don't. They're pulling all the stops, and kudos to them. They should be. Uh, yeah, I have no idea what to expect. It would not. Nothing's gonna surprise me tomorrow. If, it would not surprise me if Steven Strasburg got up and started getting loose in the Nationals bullpen to yeah. pitch an inning or so. Um, so yeah, everyone's gonna be behind Max. How much of a? How many innings can he give you of quality pitches? Yeah. Uh, quality Max Scherzer. Man, if he comes out here and shoves, that is just gonna be a jolt of energy into that dugout and that lineup, and hopefully they give him some run support to feel a little ease into it a little yeah. bit and not be forcing it too much and I, <laughs> throw out his back. I can't wait until we have normal sleep, t- days off, so that we can sit down and truly look at this entire run in its entirety with with clear eyes and hindsight and, and be able to appreciate everything that was done to get to this point. The yep. fact that they are playing this game is an absolute miracle. Yep. But now they got to win it. Yeah, they got to win. And the one thing that is definite tomorrow is – it will be the last baseball game of 2019, so we know there is an end in sight. <laughs> Win or lose, it's going to be over tomorrow. Yeah. We can go home and relax and rest and shift our Our girlfriends are going to be very, very happy. Very happy. And, um, yeah, we'll be happy to maybe shift our focus to some some off-season stuff and, and not maybe uh, around the country. Oh, well, this has been great. Maybe, uh, maybe we'll have a little parade. Too. Maybe a little parade. Nice. That would be fantastic. Game 7, World Series right here at Minute Maid Park. Tomorrow night, Astros, Nationals. Scherzer, Granke, it's going to be unbelievable. It's must-watch, obviously. The Nationals are looking to bring home the first BC championship in baseball <laughs> in however many years. It's just – it's so many storylines. It's 19 Hopefully the umpires are not part of it. Um, we're going to be here. A game with no umpires. Just get yeah. rid of them. Yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> Backyard baseball. We will, The crowd will call balls and strikes yes. because they will see it better. Yeah, our seat is actually oh! perfect for calling balls and strikes. I hear yes, right by it actually Taco is. Porch. Strong! Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, we'll, be, we'll have you covered for Game 7, of course, Mass on All Access and on Masson throughout the day. Catch Paul on Mass on All Access on Facebook, Twitter, and the Masson uh, Nationals YouTube page and the front page of uh, MassonSports.com. We'll have you... Uh, Everything Game 7 leading up to Dan and Bo on Masson at 7 o'clock for the last Nats extra post-game show, or pre-game show and also post-game show. Then Game 7 is at 8.08 on Fox. Uh, the Masson All Access podcast is brought to you by Marymount University. Visit MarymountSaints.com to learn more about student athletes and programs today. Follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Subscribe, spread the word, give us a rating, let us know what you think. You can also watch on the Masson All Access Facebook page and the Masson Nationals YouTube page at Bobby underscore Blanco for myself, at Paul Mancano for Paulie. We'll catch you at Game 7.